The topic of today's webinar is new and emerging funding sources for affordable housing development. The three funding programs we're covering today are the Equitable Community Revitalization Grant or ECRG program through the Department of Toxic Substances Control. The second is the Infill Infrastructure Grant or IIG program through the California Department of Housing and Community Development. The third is the US EPA Brownfields program. Our panelists will discuss each of the following opportunities individually and will also cover opportunities to utilize a mix of funding sources for affordable housing and brownfields development. Our panelists today are Miriam Tosniff Abbasi, Brownfield Development Manager with Cal EPA, Department of Toxic Substances, Office of Brownfields. Alexandra Miriam to start the presentation on the new ECRG program. Miriam. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dana, for that introduction. And I wanna thank everyone um, who's taken the time to be with us today to learn about these different funding sources. As Dana said, my name is Miriam Tazitha Bassi. I'm the Brownfield Development Manager for UTSC. And today I'm gonna to be previewing um, or providing an overview of the Equitable Community Revitalization Grant, which is um, a new uh, source of funding for us. So um, the ECRG or Equitable Community Revitalization Grant is part of a, a larger initiative called the Clean Up and Vulnerable Communities Initiative. And uh, this funding um, became available to us in 2021 in the summer with the passing of SB 158. About $500 million was allocated and the focus really was um, to expedite cleanup um, and reuse of uh, impacted properties. Um, it's very much brownfields focused. Brownfields are any property whose use or reuse is complicated by known or suspected contamination. And, and, and the, the narrow focus is that through this um, overall funding initiative, we really want to focus on vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. Um, we're focusing on areas with high Cal and virus screen scores, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, and just so you know, like some of the other pieces of this larger $500 million uh, pie uh, has been dedicated to some internal work. There's the Discovery Enforcement Program, which focuses on dry cleaning sites. We are going to be um, developing a framework for technical assistance grants that where community groups and residents can um, apply for grants for various scientific endeavors and to understand uh, the intersectionality of brownfields um, science and um, place based needs. There are going to be some community benefit agreements, which this has been you know, fairly recently designated for us and we haven't quite built it out yet. Uh, there's also going to be development of a workforce program, and the idea there is to create jobs um, in the communities where this money is being invested, and the jobs would be for local workers and local residents to take advantage and participate in this um, you know, historical opportunity. Uh, there's also going to be an environmental justice advisory committee. That's something that we're still building out, and um, we have sites called orphan sites. I, I know that we use that term as if everybody understands it, but actually what those are, are sites priority for, for some level of cleanup. Um, the Equitable Community Revitalization Grant or ACRG uh, provides about $270 million in grants over the next few years, um, all supporting cleanup um, to, to build up basically. Um, and the whole idea is that we want to focus on um, creating healthier spaces um, and creating you know, jobs and really uh, turning around and reusing these properties. Uh, the grants are available to uh, nonprofits, um, any kind of public entity, uh, municipalities, uh, counties, school districts, et cetera, and tribes to, to conduct community-wide assessments, investigations, and cleanups at specific sites. Next slide. So um, the applicants have to own or control the, prop the, the properties. Uh, they have to be in the highest uh, poverty areas with the highest pollution burdens. That's determined by Cal and Bioscreen. 
and um, we are using scores of 75% and above. Uh, the red areas that I have on my map um, basically uh, shows where those highest Kalenvio screen areas are. Um, but because we recognize um, the needs of uh, tribal communities and rural communities and recognizing that vulnerable populations exist throughout the state, we will also accept applications outside of those red areas if the proposed use um, provides some sort of significant benefit to a disadvantaged or vulnerable population. This is a competitive process and um, uh, just uh, FYI, the funding is based on reimbursing costs uh, to the grant uh, cost by reimbursing costs by paying um, invoices. So we don't actually um, hand over a, a, a large um, funding allocation. It's all done through reimbursement. Um, and if you wanted to explore Cal Screen a little bit more on your own, um, when Dana sends his presentation out, the little Cal Screen link in the inset inserted map is actually hyperlinked, uh, so you can kind of explore that as well. Next slide, please. So um, we are accepting pre-qualifying applications. Um, the pre-qualifying applications uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a sort of uh, program building process for us so that we can understand um, the kinds of sites and applicants that are out there because we are finalizing our scoring criteria and we just really wanted to vet that against real sites. It is a optional um, process. So if you don't um, have the capacity right now or the information ready to be able to apply for the pre-qualifying portion, um, we are going to be um, uh, releasing our full application in early January of next year. Um, in the pre-qualifying uh, stage, we will be um, speaking to more of the applicants, um, asking them questions perhaps so we can understand more fully what their circumstances are, and we will let everybody know whether or not they um, met the minimum threshold to move forward and be eligible to apply for the full application. Um, and future rounds, we, we are such a new program that we haven't really put ourselves on a schedule as to when our next offering will be. I think the goal is to see how things work out in the full application in January and see um, how many applications we get. And then we'll figure out um, whether we wanna do another offering in spring or whether that's something we wanna to push to the next uh, fiscal year, which would be later in the fall. Next slide. This graphic is available on our website, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, uh, but I do want to encourage all of you to take a look at this. We have a, a fairly detailed uh, guideline document that's um, over 30 pages long, but this one page kind of graphically gives you a sense of what information you need to gather beforehand um, and what the important dates are uh, to participate in the qualifying application and what comes forward from there. It also has um, contact information, um, uh, both for DTSC and for our technical assistance provider. We'll talk about it in a moment in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So the Center for Creative Land Recycling, which is a national nonprofit organization that's worked uh, very closely with um, US EPA on their brownfield grants as well, has been selected as our brownfield technical assistance provider. Um, they're developing a lot of resources and opportunities um, uh, for participation. Uh, they'll have uh, free webinars. Uh, there are a lot of, we've done three already. Uh, there are more that are going to be um, scheduled fairly soon. They can also provide um, application assistance through one-on-one -on -one meetings, but either virtually or in person. And one of the things that we've also um, asked them to do is provide some of that um, brownfield reuse planning um, that we don't have the expertise for in-house, uh, but that's why we did bring them on because that's something that they, they could also help with vision planning. Um, we, our, our, our website is up to date. We try to really keep things as fresh as possible, um, update um, uh, our dates and our schedules and uh, as we have webinars uh, to really visit our uh, website um, often every time you want to get a little bit more of an update. And all the staff from DTSC's Office of Brownfields is also available for support. Next slide, please. So um, these are just some hyperlinks uh, to our resources. And um, 
you know, what I wanted to kind of like share with the audience today is that we can pick up, you know, many different aspects of a cleanup or investigation. And um, I wanted to give an example of a situation where uh, there may be a site that an applicant is considering for the development of affordable housing, but there's recognition that there are some environmental conditions there. Maybe there's um, a uh, source from a nearby dry cleaner that has affected the property. Uh, you can come to the ECRG for a um, grant to help you complete the investigation um, and develop a plan for cleanup. And um, our projects are two-year timelines. Um, we want some acceleration in the work that's being done and being asked for, and that's why we have those two-year timelines. And so two years uh, is, um, is enough time to maybe do an investigation and, and uh, implement, uh, or at least get a cleanup plan approved, but not necessarily um, build the whole thing out. If you get to the end of your ECRG grant and you've got um, your cleanup plan approved through working with us, one of the things you can do is then work with um, Alex on the IIG grant and they perhaps can pick up the cost for the implementation of the cleanup plan, which is putting in uh, perhaps a vapor barrier, some kind of vapor control system and um, whatever is needed for future monitoring. Um, neither one of our programs will pick up the cost for like long-term monitoring, but we can pick up the cost for the um, construction of whatever system, whatever system needs to be in place to ensure long-term efficacy of the, um, uh, 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 of the cleanup um, system that's in place. And so, um, you know, Alex and I will work on work out some details a little bit more. Um, but what we'd like to see, you know, a broader scale are sites that filter from the ECRG and then perhaps go to IIG for some um, end stage uh, remedial work and then use that funding um, to kind of uh, uh, go up uh, with the infrastructure. And so those are some things to keep in mind that these um, buckets of uh, money that is being made available to, um, you know, through the state uh, can be uh, used together for really maximum benefit to the community. Uh, next slide, please. Our whole goal is to reduce environmental uncertainty. We know that that's a really big concern for people, um, municipalities, nonprofits, anyone who's in the space of taking a brownfield and bringing it to a higher and better use. And through the reduction of the environmental uncertainties, we hope that we help remove barriers to the planning and of course made, make the land safe for proposed uses. So that's one of the things that really is um, in our technical uh, wheelhouse that we really do want to make sure that the land is safe and we have technical capability and resources to be able to do so. And now we be, are able to provide the money um, for you to kind of meet your goals of uh, cleaning up and building up. With that, I think I'm at the end of my presentation today um, and I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Dana. Thank you so much, Miriam. Next, we will- Thank you, Dana. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Alex and I'm a senior specialist for climate programs at California Department of Housing and Community Development, which we also refer to as HCD. Um, during my presentation today, Dana, please next. Um, during my presentation today, I will provide a brief overview of the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program, also referring to as IIG. I will first provide some background information for the program, and after that, I will go over the regulatory documents that guide the application process. Low-income households are more vulnerable to climate change and they lack of resources to respond to extreme weather events. Within this presentation, I would like to discuss a state resource IIG program that's available for the development of infrastructure for affordable housing in ways that responds to environmental justice concerns. Next slide, please. HCD's infill infrastructure grant development program is closely connected to the underlying concepts of infill development and smart growth. And I would like to start this presentation by explaining the concepts that help inform and shape the program. IIG provides gap funding for infrastructure improvements critical to residential and mixed use infill development. 
Infield development provides broad environmental benefits, which includes reducing sprawl, vehicle miles traveled, and greenhouse gas emissions. At the local level, these approaches increase walkability, provide a sense of place, and reduce exposure to contamination through cleanup of former industrial sites. Another concept related to IIG program is the concept of smart growth. And some of the principles that are considered to be foundation of smart growth approach also overlap with the concept of infield development. So here we are talking about mixed land uses, utilizing compact design, creating a range of housing opportunities, creating walkable neighborhoods, among others. Next, I would like to provide a brief overview of IIG programs. So if you're new to the program and would like to know a little bit about IIG history, this next section is going to focus on the main authorities, funding sources, and previous uh, NOFA rounds. Next slide, please. The program's objective establishes criteria and standards against which the department can determine program performance. And the primary objective of this program is to promote infill housing development. This objective is accomplished by providing financial assistance for capital improvement projects that are a part of or necessary to facilitate the development of a qualifying infill project, which we also refer to as a QIP, or a qualifying infill area or QIA. We'll go over each one of these concepts later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Under the program, grants are available for infrastructure improvements necessary for residential or mixed use uh, infill development projects or areas. Next slide, please. So a little bit of history. Um, since its inception in 2006, funding for IIG has been provided by two propositions, uh, Proposition 1C and Proposition 1, and Assembly Bill 101. So to, to give you a sense of history, IIG program was created by Prop 1C in 2006. Since its first round of funding in 2008 until Round 5 in Alpha issued in 2017, through funding from Prop 1C, IIG has awarded 600 million to residential and mixed use developments. These developments created approximately 13,000 new affordable rental homes for low-income Californians, more than uh, 200 ownership homes for low and moderate income households, and it funded hundreds of infrastructure projects that were necessary preconditions for this housing. So from new parks, sidewalks, transit linkages to water services, uh, sewer and street improvements. Funding for round six, NOFA and program requirements were provided under Assembly Bill 101. On June uh, 26th of 2019, the governor signed the fiscal year 2019-2020 state budget into law, allocating 1.75 billion to increase housing production. 29% of these funds or 500 million were allocated to the Info Infrastructure Grant Program. And then finally, Prop 1. Um, in 2017, SB 3 placed the Prop 1 housing bond in the November of 2018 ballot. Uh, Prop 1 authorized the state to issue 4 billion in general obligation bonds to support housing development, including 300 million for the IIG program. Next slide, please. On this slide, as you can see, um, HCD has thus far over seven funding cycles awarded more than 800 million to IIG program applicants. Last round, round seven IIG NOFA, the amount was um, 160 million. So that was a little bit about the program background. So how does the program work? Um, next slide, please. So the program is administered by HCD to announce funding to potential applicants and start the application process. We issue a notice of funding availability, also referred to as an OFA. The NOFA is governed by the IIG program guidelines, which we usually issue or update at the same time as the NOFA. IIG guidelines establish terms, conditions, and procedures to fund awards through the NOFA. You can find the guidelines and the latest NOFA on IIG website. 
um, and the latest uh, sets of guidelines and NOFA were issued in May of uh, 21. Next, we are gonna go over some basic rules one should know when applying for IIG funds. Um, next slide, please. So to apply for IIG funds, the prospective applicants have to first establish if they qualify under the program definition of the eligible applicants. And according to the program rules, eligible applicants mean one of the following. So to apply for a QIP, uh, one has to be a nonprofit or for-profit developer. To apply for a QIA, uh, one has to be a jurisdiction, meaning a city, county, public housing authority, or a successor to the redevelopment agency. Um, and also to apply for a QIA and QIP, um, the applicant can be Indian Reservation or Rancheria to apply for a QIA, or a tribally designated housing entity to apply for a QIP. Next slide, please. As for the eligible projects, um, I already mentioned that IIG promotes infill development by providing financial assistance for capital improvement projects that are a part of or necessary to facilitate the development of a QIP or QIA. So what do these concepts mean? Um, capital improvement project. Um, that means the construction, rehab, demolition, relocation, preservation, acquisition, or other physical improvements of a capital asset that's a part of or necessary to facilitate the development of a qualifying info project or a qualifying info area. To be eligible for funding, a capital improvement project has to be necessary for the development of either a QIP or housing designated within a QIA. By capital asset here, we mean tangible physical property that includes, um, but is not directly related to construction or acquisition. And this includes planning, engineering, construction management, architectural and other design works and other costs. Uh, would you mind just going to the next slide? I just wanna make sure that I'm perfect. Um, so qualifying info projects, what does that mean? Um, so qualifying info project that a capital improvement project must be a part of is a residential or mixed use residential development project that has to be located within an urbanized area on a site that has been previously developed or on a vacant site that has at least 75% of the parameter of the site adjoining parcels that are developed with urban uses. Qualifying info area is pretty much two or more qualifying info projects. Next slide, please. The guidelines state that program grants, grant funds should be used for necessary costs of a capital improvement project. And these costs include construction, rehab, demolition, relocation, preservation, acquisition, or other physical improvements of the following. And I'll give you a second to take a look at the list of available costs under IIG. Next slide, please. And this would be the list of ineligible costs. So some of the ineligible costs include um, developer fees, uh, site acquisition for housing and mixed use structural improvements, housing or mixed use structures, um, soft costs that are related to these ineligible costs and replacement fees for local inclusionary programs. Next slide, please. To qualify or pass the threshold, the threshold criteria, the QIP or QIAs have to meet all of the following conditions. So both infill projects and areas have to have been either previously developed or be largely surrounded by development. They have to be located in an urbanized area. Localities must have housing element compliance. They have to include at least 15% of the total residential units to be developed as affordable units. They have to meet the minimum density requirements. Um, they have to be located in an area designated for mixed use or residential development. They have to meet 
uh, the requirements for unit replacement um, and others. Uh, you can find all of this information in the guidelines, but these are prerequisites to pass the threshold requirements. Um, next slide, please. Once the applicant passes the threshold requirement, he enters the selection criteria. Uh, the application selection criteria includes project readiness, affordability, housing density, access to transit, proximity to amenities, and consistency with regional plans. So the, the applicant has to pass threshold, as I said, before being scored. Funds are then allocated through a competitive process based on the merit of the individual infill project and area. Next slide, please. The funds are announced in the notice of funding availability, which is usually issued at the same time as the updated guidelines. Uh, the NOFA specifies the details such as the amount of funds available, minimum and maximum eligible point scores, application requirements, tie breaking criteria, and others. Um, along with the NOFA, we also issue a refined application. Uh, so if we take a look at the last uh, NOFA released in May of this year, the NOFA was in the amount of 160 million. NOFA specified grant amounts and limits. And the last NOFA established that for QIP, the minimum grant amount was 1 million. Uh, maximum grant amount was 7.5 million. For QIA, minimum grant amount was 2 million and maximum grant amount was 30 million. The NOFA also establishes geographic targets to the maximum extent feasible, the department ensures a reasonable, a reasonable geographic distribution of funds. Geographic targets in the last NOFA were the following. Um, so 45% of the funds was allocated to Southern California, 25% to North California, 10% to Central Valley, and 10% to counties with a population of less than 250,000. Next slide, please. Finally, to tell you a little bit about the timeline. So if we take a look at the last NOFA issued on May 12th, um, applications, applicants had two months to apply. Applications were due on July 12th. And then awards were announced two, usually are announced two or three months later. I think for the last NOFA, it was two months later. Uh, following that um, standard agreement, is signed approximately 90 days after the award notification. Next slide, please. I know this is a lot of information, especially for those who haven't applied for IIG previously. Um, Dana will share this recording and I can definitely share the PowerPoint. If you have any specific questions, any project related question, you can either email me my email is on the screen, or if you have general questions and comments, you can also send a note to um, IIG email also on the screen. Or if you would like to take a look at the last uh, IIG guidelines and the NOFA, you can go to the website or ask us to send you additional information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. We'll go to Amy, who will uh, discuss our EPA Brownfields grant program today. Here we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Jalowski. I am um, a National Brownfields Practice Lead for SCS Engineers. I do do a lot of work um, with uh, US EPA Brownfield grantees, um, supporting Brownfields grant applications, but also helping with the implementation of those grants. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the US EPA Brownfields grant program and the funding that's available through them. Um, it's actually timely to be talking about this, maybe a little bit late in the, in the time frame to be talking about this. The uh, EPA Brownfield grant cycle is getting ready to grant applications um, are due to EPA December 1st of 2021. So there's just a few weeks left in the, this current cycle to get applications in. Uh, EPA Brownfields has uh, multiple grant programs within their purview. This current grant cycle, they are for FY22. 
They are providing um, for cleanup grants, assessment grants, and revolving loan fund grants. And I'll talk with you about some of the details of each of those today. But just overall, I think sometimes when we're talking about uh, regulators um, like EPA or some of our state regulators, sometimes people have a little hesitancy to get involved with those programs. Um, it's very important to know that the Brownfields programs um, are, are not um, enforcement programs within US EPA. They're, we like to call them white hat EPA. Um, they're really there to help. They're there to empower um, our communities and stakeholders uh, through economic development by helping them get these properties assessed, inventoried and safely cleaned up. And so they really are um, a helping hand um, and providing a lot of technical assistance as well as finances uh, for these um, Brownfields properties. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, EPA has several different types of Brownfields grants. Um, the, the assessment grants help us do a lot of the phase one due diligence, phase two work um, at properties. There's direct cleanup plant grants specifically for sites. And then there's also the revolving loan funds, which is a, a larger loan program that allows for low interest loans for Brownfields cleanup. There are a few other grants that EPA provides. They're not available this uh, current fiscal year 2022 grant cycle. And those are multi-purpose grants. Um, and also uh, right now, job training grants are not available. They, I think they've already had that cycle go through. And then EPA does provide kind of on a cyclical basis throughout the year targeted brownfields assessments, um, and then also state and tribal response program grants. Next slide, please. Just a few uh, details about the EPA brownfields assessment grants. These grants are available to help inventory properties. So if you're a community that's trying to evaluate just where your um, distressed properties are within your community, you can, can do an inventory of those. You can assess those properties, do your phase one environmental site assessment for due diligence, um, your phase two characterize um, the contamination that's there and also conduct cleanup and redevelopment planning. They also very much encourage community involvement related to all of these assessment tasks. And the assessment grants can be applied at a community-wide level or a site-specific level. The community-wide grants are, uh, the funding is available up to $500,000 and it can evaluate both hazardous substance and petroleum sites. So that's important. I think a lot of times for infill projects where we're looking at um, potentially renovating existing structures, it does allow you to do things like asbestos surveys and lead-based paint surveys, but also deal with below ground issues like dry cleaning sites and um, underground storage tanks. The eligible entities for these grants are general purpose units of government, so cities, counties, but also some of the redevelopment or economic development agencies within those general purpose units of government. Um, nonprofits are eligible for these grant dollars and states and tribes. Um, again, you can do those phase ones and phase twos, all of the kind of assessment work, environmental assessment work that goes into de redeveloping distressed properties, but also with these assessment grants, there's the ability to do um, some real hands-on redevelopment planning in terms of market evaluations and analysis, looking at site design and doing real specific um, visioning and redevelopment planning within the community. Next slide, please. One of the other grants that's available through US EPA is their cleanup grant. Um, these grants are very specific for cleanup work um, and activities at Brownfield sites. You do have to have completed a phase two environmental site assessment prior to your grant application. Um, it's important in these grants that you have an understanding of what your, the environmental conditions of the property are and that you can define that in your grant application. These grants are available up to 500,000 per property with some ability for EPA to waiver um, that up to, up to $650,000. There is also, um, the assessment grants do not have a cost share requirement. 
the cleanup grants do have a cost share requirement of 20%. And that can be accomplished. Very rarely does that um, include uh, cash out of pocket. A lot of times it can be handled with in-kind services and things like that. But you do also have to have fee simple title of the property um, prior to application. And there are some public notice requirements as a part of that grant. Um, like I said, you do have to have your phase two complete. And again, the eligible applicants are your general purpose, same as the assessment grant, general purpose unit of governments, nonprofits, states, and tribes. Um, it can be used for vapor mitigation, similar to how Miriam was mentioning earlier, opportunities for that. Also for cleanup planning, kind of getting uh, ready with your uh, regulatory agencies, working through site closures, um, active remediation, and asbestos and lead-based paint abatement. Next slide, please. The third opportunity that's available currently within this grant cycle for EPA is their revolving loan fund grants. These allow um, the grantees to make low interest loans and subgrants um, to carry out cleanup activities on Brownfields properties. Where we see this um, being really effective in communities is when a municipality or a a general purpose unit of government or state or nonprofit is able to take those funds and you can make loans out to the private sector, oftentimes low interest loans at the very kind of start of redevelopment when you're um, implementing some of those environmental um, actions to address cleanup. And it kind of flows, it allows you to get um, low interest money into the development kind of early on. Um, it's certainly a more sophisticated program. The grantee need, really needs to be able to demonstrate to EPA that they're seasoned within the Brownfields kind of redevelopment space and that they have the ability and understanding to implement a loan program. Um, the, funding, the funding available for this loan, fund, loan it, or this grant program is, a, is $1 million per eligible entity. The requirement of of from EPA is that at least 60% of that funding is used for loans, which would revolve back to um, the applicant. And then a maximum of 40% of that funding would be allowed for um, subgrants. There is a cost share requirement on the revolving loan fund application or on the loan fund grants as well of 20%. And again, um, same eligible applicants, the general purpose unit of government, nonprofit states, um, and those eligible activities are really the loans and those subgrants. Next slide, please. But um, before I was gonna just kind of take us back and kind of re remind us what this whole, um, all three presentations today have talked about in terms of this larger redevelopment process and what we're trying to accomplish in our communities um, through these programs. I think first, really quick, I wanted to say just a few larger topic things on the EPA grants. Um, most of the EPA grants, um, the assessment grant and the cleanup grant have a three year um, lifespan. So the assessment grants go on for three years. The a revolving and cleanup grants have a lifespan of three years. The revolving loan fund grant actually has a, a five year, but often goes on much longer depending on how you revolve um, those funds. And it is also an annual uh, program. So typically we see grant application guidance come out in the fall. Uh, grants are due sometime typically in November and December. The grants are typically, we hear about awards for those grants in um, April or May typically, and then funding for people that have been successful in their grant application is usually available beginning in August. So it is almost a, 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 about a nine month process from application to being able to use those funds. So it's a little bit of a longer, um, longer stretch for the application, um, but maybe some additional funding to kind of add to the funding that the other presenters have talked about today. Um, I wanted to share uh, this slide just as a kind of a, of a reminder of kind of what we're trying, what we're all trying to accomplish um, and really note that this Brownfields grant support is kind of at the center, I think, of this process for so many projects, whether it's 
the state funding or um, the housing department's funding or US EPA's funding. Um, so often when we're looking at brownfields redevelopment, you know, our communities or our developers have identified these underutilized properties that are potentially contaminated and the, the market kind of dictates whether or not they're going to need, whether the private sector can handle those challenges or whether we're going to need public investment in those challenges. Um, and that's really where these brownfields funds from all, from all of these programs can really be integral in moving it through the brownfields process um, into uh, cleanup and property redevelopment and ultimately back into beneficial reuse. This is one of my favorite brownfields um, before and afters to share. The name of the, the finished product was called social capital. And I think so much of so many of the brownfields professionals that we work with, we, we recognize that that's what we're building. Oftentimes in, in our communities with these projects, we're building social capital um, in addition to property values and reducing environmental conditions and reducing blight. We know we're building equity um, with this work and especially with the focus on some of these funding sources. We know we're enhancing sustainability and we're also um, building the property and sales tax base with these projects. So um, hopefully we've, we've kind of been able to give you a taste of what some of these grant programs and how they can support and kind of fit into the middle of these processes as you're looking at these underutilized properties and kind of dreaming with our communities. Thank you, Amy. And also thank you, Miriam and Alexandra for your presentations as well. Another reminder, if you have any questions, please send them over in the chat. I see we have a couple from Samantha, so we'll go ahead and start in order. Is IIG the only program that for-profit affordable housing developers can apply to? Miriam, for the ECRG program, do you wanna discuss the opportunities that for-profit affordable housing developers Sure, uh, yes, in the context of that. Absolutely, absolutely. So for-profit affordable housing builders cannot directly apply because they're not one of the eligible um, applicants. However, what we recommend is that you, you partner with an eligible applicant that you may already be working for. Um, from my understanding, many of these um, affordable housing projects um, happen in partnership with municipal partners and nonprofit partners. And because we don't require ownership on our applications, uh, that is something that could work potentially. Thanks. Thank Anna. you. Amy, what about for the EPA Brownfields program? Any, any points there for for-profit affordable housing developers? I think it would be um, similar. Probably the revolving loan fund program would be their best. Um, option or if they can partner with communities that have re received those funds, I guess that would be the better way to say that. So assessment grants can be used by a community to support uh, development projects as kind of an economic development incentive. If a community would like to work with a developer and um, support uh, due diligence projects with their EPA grant, they can do that. Um, and then they can also make uh, revolving loan fund loans and grants out, or revolving loan fund loans out to private developers, for-profit developers as well. Thank you. We this also have, yeah, so I was just gonna introduce you. We also have Craig oh. Shields from HCD who is available to answer questions. Uh, Craig, any more points on the IIG program? Thanks, I'll just add that um, the vast majority of our uh, housing and infrastructure funding programs at the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, include for-profit and not-for-profit housing developers as eligible applicants. The IIG uh, qualifying infill area segment that my colleague Alexandra talked about is, is one of the few exceptions where um, for that segment of that program, only uh, localities are eligible to apply. But for the vast majority of our programs, we invite for-profit and not-for-profit developers to apply. Thank you. The second question from Samantha, and I think we could probably go through the same way for each of the funding sources. 
For any of the affordable housing programs, are there limits on the total minimum amount of dwelling units that a project must have? We'll start back up again with Miriam for ECRG. Hi, thanks, Dana, and thanks so much for that question. Um, no, we don't get into the reuse um, in any sort of depth because it's not our jurisdiction. So uh, that component is not something that is important to us in an evaluation of an application. Thank you. Amy, any limits with the EPA Brownfields funding? Uh, no, not really. Their, you know, their, their grant funding is really related to kind of that larger story that goes into the, um, for the community. So I don't think that there's any, um, I don't think that they would have any project specific limits or anything like that. Um, the, the redevelopment is certainly part of the story and part of the compelling, uh, a compelling grant application, but not really um, the end game for EPA either. Alexandra or Craig, any comments on affordable housing? units under the HCD programs? Treasure sure, Ross. Well, for the IIG program, we ask applicants to request a minimum of $1 million for most uh, projects and $500,000 for projects in areas that are um, rural areas, smaller areas. Um, the IIG grant amount is calculated on the number of units that are in the project. So, it's, it's sort of a, a little math equation. You have to have at least enough units to request a million dollars. And we find that most of our um, qualifying infill project applications are, I would say in the range of, of three to $6 million and, and often have, um, I don't know, Alex, would you say 70 to 100 units in a typical application? Correct. I'll just add that the maximum for QIPs is seven and a half million. Majority of the projects we receive do fall in the bracket that Craig just described. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. If anyone's typing in any questions, we'll give them another minute. Otherwise, if you have questions that come up after our presentation today, Everyone's contact information is available here on the screen. I wanna thank you all. We have another project coming in from Samantha, or another question, I'm sorry. Are the programs for fourplex or for smaller affordable housing projects? I'll go ahead and answer on behalf of ECRG. You know, once again, because our projects are focused on the environmental uh, investigation and cleanup, um, we don't take into consideration um, the details of the reuse. We just want to know what type of reuse is being planned. Uh, it really comes down to how much contamination there is that has to be addressed. And that's gonna be a, a bigger determinant for our program. Thank you. Thank you. I would say that for our um, state housing department programs, you know, they're awfully complex. So in order to uh, make it worthwhile, we, we often find for, for, for most of our programs that um, it, it's for bigger projects, dozens and dozens, you know, 70 to 100 units. I think um, local governments, cities are more apt to have um, funding programs that are, are geared toward smaller develops, developments, but those are equally important. So I, I'm glad to have that question. Wonderful. I would just encourage you maybe to take a look at one program that comes to mind is Call Home, which is not one of our climate programs, but it is one of HCD programs uh, exclusively fund single family homes. And I'm not sure what the current limits are, but it could perhaps fall into um, smaller affordable housing projects that you're aiming for. So the program is Call Home. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Alexandra. A question that uh, came up previously, and this is for Miriam. Can I apply for ECRG funding on a site that has had EPA Brownfields funding? Yes, absolutely. You can apply for um, an ECRG if you uh, now need to move um, and do some uh, greater level, deeper level of uh, cleanup or assessment. And um, that works really well for us because so much of our program is based on EPA grants. Um, and so it should be a good fit. 
and we, we would love to have your application in. Wonderful. We're getting close to the top of the hour. I don't see any other questions coming let, let in. Let me just jump. Let me just jump in quickly, Dan. Sure thing, Dan. SCS, SCS engineers. Um, Miriam, we've been, SES has been screening some sites. We probably screen half a dozen sites with potential applicants. It seems like one of the biggest issues or potential impediments that's coming up you already addressed, and that's um, that you need a, a nonprofit <clears throat> or public sector entity possibly to, to be able to apply. So trying to figure out some sort of a creative structure there, a public private partnership um, or some way to insert a, a nonprofit into the equation, I think is important or helpful. And I don't know if you have any further thoughts on that or if you have discussed that internally within DTSC, but I think that will be important because that's immediately screening out, you know, probably half of the sites that we've been looking at. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we haven't offered any grants either now in the past that, um, you know, provide funding for for-profit organizations. And um, we did in the beginning um, try to kind of parse out um, for-profit affordable housing builders, uh, but there was a lot of complication from the legal side on how that was defined. And right. so that's why that's something that we stepped away, uh, we stepped away from that for that reason. Um, in, a, in the research that we did, we did notice that there were a lot of 100% um, affordable housing developments that generally did have a municipal and a nonprofit partner engaged right. to a greater or lesser degree. And, um, you know, that's why we did not require ownership because we recognized that there would be uh, some situations where the, um, the, the deals were structured in a way uh, where perhaps not having, um, not requiring ownership could be the way in um, mm -hmm. for some of these projects. So uh, right. we hope that that could work, can work out. And uh, that was something that we were able to count as a win as we ran through the structure of this program through our management and our legal office. Yeah, you know, for tax credit projects, there would almost always be a nonprofit entity that would be participating in part of that. Uh, I was just trying to think creatively about maybe there's some other other opportunities or projects or way to, way to think about things. The, the other quick question I had was you were saying um, that you were generally agnostic about what the end use was, but if I understand correctly, the way that you will evaluate applications will be with respect to the potential for community benefit. All other things being equal, wouldn't you consider uh, a project that's providing uh, housing that has affordable housing to be providing a greater community benefit and therefore maybe um, more desirable for your funding than a project that doesn't have affordable housing? Yeah, I, uh, we, we haven't seen how the applications, you know, come in and line up against each other. Obviously, it's going to be a competitive analysis, and therefore that's going to contribute in the way we score the applications. Mm -hmm. So right now, we're not, like you said, providing any scores for any specific reuse per se, but we do ask a lot of questions as to why the community needs that particular um, reuse. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions that go into, um, you know, um, equity and um, prevention of displacement, um, mm -hmm. making these developments transit oriented, increasing accessibility to whatever the reuse is going to be to the existing residents. So there are a lot of questions that we ask in that regard um, mm -hmm. that are going to help us kind of create the point spaces for, for applications. Mm -hmm. And I think with that narrative, um, I have a feeling that affordable housing, uh, parks, public schools, uh, li public libraries, and other uses that really truly are for the community who live in the community, will eventually score better. Um, and that's based on, you know, nothing but two fully submitted pre-qualifying applications right now. Um, we'll have to see how things go out when we sure. build out. But I think that the, the um, now that our structure for the scoring um, section of the application is, is getting more developed, um, these sorts of questions that go around um, uh, serving the community in which the reuse is going to happen, uh, is going to be an important consideration. And to your point, 100% um, affordable housing projects, I think will inevitably do well in this system. 
Thanks for the clarification. Thank you, Miriam. Um, about um, access to IIG funding for um, for-profit developers. Uh, so within the infill infrastructure grants program, there are really two, two programs. One that is designed for localities to identify an area with at least one um, housing development planned where they're gonna build streets, maybe build a bridge, big, big things up to $30 million. And then there's the other type that is the qualifying infill project. And that is essentially a housing development. Um, and that's where the for-profit and not-for-profit developers are in fact eligible applicants and they can apply for up to seven and a half million dollars for all of the same stuff, even if the city has said, oh, you know, you need to widen this street in order to build your housing development, we would fund that or on-site improvements like underground sewer or other utilities, things like that. So for sure, developers are eligible applicants in the qualifying infill project area of infill infrastructure grant program. Thank you, Craig. And I, I'm sorry, I missed one from, from Stephen. Is there any expectation that annual IIG funding will increase in coming years? So we have about $400 million um, available for early 2022 um, from both Proposition 1 um, bond funding and from the general fund. Beyond that, there is no funding designated for IIG. Um, it's a very, very popular program. It's one of the department's very successful legacy programs. So we certainly hope that there will be future funding, but um, you, all of us, can contact right to our state senators and our members of assembly to talk up the program and ask for them to secure more funding for it. Awesome. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. So I'm gonna say thank you again to all of our panelists and all of our attendees and have a great day, everyone. All right. Thanks, Dana. Bye. Thanks everyone.